Hello, everyone, and welcome to this um, ESCO seminar on um, measuring human capital in the UK economic accounts and experimental satellite account. I think we're very pleased to have Robert Dunn from the ONS to speak on this topic. Uh, Robert has a, a vast experience that um, uh, provides um, necessary background um, to look at this very difficult um, issue. Uh, Robert has worked in the production and methodology of macro statistics for uh, over 20 years, both in ONS and internationally, and has worked on a diver diverse range of, of areas, including capital stocks and national balance sheets, supply and use tables, and ESA 2010 implementation, among many other things. Uh, he spent four years working for Eurostat before returning to, to, to work at ONS in the business architecture transformation and strategy division. And he's currently working on transforming economic statistics production systems. Uh, Robert will talk for 40 minutes and um, questions should be submitted to the Q&A and please um, submit as the webinar progresses. Uh, and so we'll then have 20 minutes for, for, for questions at the end. OK, Robert, over to you. Thank you, Mary. All right. Welcome, everyone. Um, this presentation um, is based upon a ESCO discussion paper, which I wrote and was published in May 2020. Two, looking at how human capital can be integrated into the UK economic accounts and what those types of impacts are and what's the um, issues that we face by doing so. So this presentation is split into more or less two parts. One part looking at the conceptual difficulties and data requirements. And the second bit, looking at um, the integration of the current ONS uh, human capital stock estimates into the framework of the sequence of accounts. Uh, I should also note that the it was the paper was published um, through ESCO, so the opinions within that paper and in this presentation are my own and not necessarily those of the Office for National Statistics. All right. So in this presentation, I'm going to briefly give a bit of background and to, to contextualize the human capital issue. Then again, a brief look at what the system of national accounts framework looks like. Why human capital is not currently treated as an asset in the system of national accounts. Uh, the principles of a satellite account, and then we move on to looking at the conceptual points to solve from the first principles of national accounts methodology. And then we consider what could be probably the biggest issue we face is when we're talking about human capital and the production functions, are we talking labor inputs or are we talking mainly a human capital asset input? And then we um, round up with the first experimental results uh, using published um, human capital estimates. And we will see what sort of impacts they have on the main ec economic aggregates. And then we draw some conclusions to end with. Okay, so in terms of background, a human capital first uh, came to prominence within economic growth theory back in the 1960s, where it was seen as, um, as a quality um, improvement on the labor input. This then got developed into new growth theory, um, um, ideas of human capital being a source of, or generating externalities such as innovation. In terms of the national accounts, um, the UN's Economic Council of Europe in 2016 published a guide on measuring human capital, which set out some of the basis of the satellite account for human capital. Uh, more currently, we have the System of National Accounts revision discussions, which are ongoing, which include um, human capital discussions and labor account discussions and um, education and training account discussions. 
We also human capital features within the ONS's Beyond GDP work stream, where they're looking at more inclusive measures of income, which we would include things like human capital and natural capital and other types of non-standard capital. And finally, in terms of the background, is my own paper from last year, which is what this presentation is based upon. So what are the system of national accounts frameworks? So in essence, where the, the system of, a, of accounts looks at explaining how a country moves between a opening balance sheet position and therefore an opening net worth position and a closing balance sheet position and, and therefore a closing net worth. And they do this through um, capturing a number of transactions within a sequence of accounts and also looking at the revaluation of the stocks and other um, changes in volumes. Uh, so the other volume changes are essentially non-transactions and non-price effects. And the transactions are captured within a sequence of accounts, starting with the production account and going flowing through those to the use of income and finally into the capital account and the financial account. Uh, so the main macroeconomic aggregates are seen uh, in the framework as uh, balancing items of particular accounts. So GDP, gross domestic product, is a balancing item within the production account. Uh, savings is a balancing item within the use of income account. You will note that net lending, net borrowing is, is a macroeconomic aggregate in two places within the framework. Firstly, the capital account and then the financial account. So the capital account sets out what uh, the lending or borrowing position or requirement is. And then the financial account shows how that net lending is achieved or that net borrowing is financed. So these two numbers conceptually are the, are the, are the same. So this is the framework that we're looking within our satellite account to fit human capital into. So why is human capital not currently treated as a, an asset in the system of national accounts? This is for two reasons. Firstly, it's to do with the production boundary. Because human capital is acquired through learning, studying and experiences, those activities can't be undertaken on behalf of somebody. So this is what is known as the third party criterion. So, and so in essence, human capital isn't included because it can't be produced independently of a person and therefore brought to a market and sold to an individual to count as a transaction as economic ownership changes. The second reason why it's not currently in the system of national accounts is to, it's not seen within that system, the core of, of that system as a, an asset, because again, it's embodied in an individual and it's very difficult to um, envision a tradable ownership right because people and the, what they know isn't tradable in the, the current sense of an asset. So these are the two reasons why it's not in the current um, national accounts. So the way to get to start the discussions and to understand things is to look at um, it through a satellite account. So this expands the analytical capacity of the core national accounts, and it does so in organizing information with an analytical focus, yet maintaining links to the existing national accounts. Um, so examples of a satellite account where this takes place is tourism. Um, we can also add information about a particular aspect of the economy or arrange information differently across sectors. And or, for example, we could gather business expenditures on training treated as intermediate consumption in the core accounts and education related expenditures by households and governments and bring them all together to show how um, education and training is done. In our, our case, we are actually expanding the analytical capacity of the core national accounts by relaxing what I've just shown on the previous slide 
the production boundary requirements and the asset boundary requirements so that we now can treat human capital as both being produced and as an asset. Right, we now move a bit of a break and move on to the conceptual points. The first conceptual is how do we define human capital? So within the, the paper, I list a, a number of definitions used throughout time. But for persons of this presentation, focusing on the final definition which we use within the paper, which is that, that human capital can be defined as the knowledge, skills, competencies, and other attributes embodied in individuals or groups of individuals acquired during their life and used to produce goods, services, or ideas in market circumstances. So again, it's focusing in on, let's look at it from a purely economic basis. Uh, there are more wider definitions of human capital, particularly the OECD's um, 2001 definition, which brings out and expands on this to include a social dimension. Right. Uh, so, as I set up when we're looking at the framework, we're looking at the movement between two balance sheet positions, and to do that requires the identification of a number of items. So we need to have transactions. So gross investment and depreciation, otherwise known as consumption of fixed capital. We need to work out revaluations, so nominal price effects on the stocks as it moves between one period and the next. And other volume changes, which are neither transactions or price related. These other volume changes can be seen as quite important for human capital, but are, are difficult to measure because as will be discussed, what we see in the satellite account as other volume changes are things like immigration and immigration. And it can also be um, things like um, uh, cohort effects as people leave, become economically un um, inactive. So, sorry become economically inactive um, before they reach retirement age. Right. So one of the biggest issues to contend with is where is human capital produced? Current international guidance on human capital, uh, which is um, the UNECE's human capital um, guide, mentions two options for how human capital can be seen to be produced. Option one is to look upon the relevant activities in the sector paying for the produced services as producing a capital output and subsequently transferring those outputs via capital transfers to the household sector. So education is produced, mandatory education is produced within the government sector and therefore that's where we would see it be produced. And then you would see a capital transfer between the government sector and the household as the human capital moves between the two. Option two is to look upon the relevant activity in the sector paying for the produce services as producing a non-capital output that is transferred to the households where it is used as an intermediate consumption into the production process of households producing their own human capital. Given what we said previously about human capital being embodied in people and it be based upon their education and experiences, it's option two, which is our preferred option and one which is used to construct the, the experimental satellite account. So what, are, what can be seen as the inputs to a human capital asset production function? Of course, Inputs can be seen as education, state and private funded, and purchase training. But then we think we've got things about, what about work experience? A person's experiences can um, build human capital, but, but some work experiences are more valuable than others in this regard. And we also got in-house training. Is in-house training building human capital or is it building some type of knowledge which is only usable by that particular company or that particular industry. So again, is 
is are these two inputs to the human capital production process. Within the discussion paper, we, we kept it quite simple and quite um, contained by just looking at um, the um, edu education and training. The, so state and private funded education and purchase training. Right, so now we've set things up a little bit in that we've decided that the human capital asset is going to be produced within the household sector because it's embodied in people. We know that um, the education and training is, is predominantly produced in another sector from the household and that we're going to be recognizing it as a non-capital output and then using a it and being used by the household as an intermediate input into producing human capital. So this involves routing human capital to the whole household sector. The first part, state funded education, because it's, it's being produced by a non-market sector and a non-market, predominantly and as non-market output, it can't directly be consumed by a household sector because of it being because non-market output can only be cons consumed by the non-market sector producing it so we have to reclassify it to, to be classed as a market output so that the household can consume it similarly as purchase training is counted as an output of an intermediate human capital asset for input in, um, from other institutional sectors. So that um, it moves out of a company's intermediate consumption and, and it forms part of their output. And we also have to incorporate a current transfer to households to facilitate this rerouting because no money in is recorded as physically changing hands within the economy we have to have this current transfer to to balance the books if you like and this means that when we get down to the final balancing items of net lending net borrowing those don't change because there's no new financing for human capital formation and by having a current transfer is what enables that to happen Uh, and how do we capture human capital investment from the start of education? So the first step is the recording of the human capital asset production as output for own consumption in the household sector. Because the households are seen as consuming education and training as inputs and producing it within their sector and then consuming it themselves, it's output for own consumption. This is of importance because it allows for the recording of human capital assets as GFCF as it is formed. So as when somebody starts school, instead of recording work in progress until they reach 16 and can enter the, the, the economy and the job market, we can show the human capital forming from that point in time and then record it as GFCF in their human capital asset. The last kind of big point on the conceptual front is, are we dealing with a paradigm shift between what is a labor input versus what is a human capital asset input? This is of, of again of importance because for, for assets and, and in our, our case, the return to human capital asset needs to be recorded in the accounts as net operating surplus. And we need to think carefully because we need to avoid double counting within the framework. Because the return to human capital assets, um, we, we've got to think about balancing um, the return to human capital asset and a return to a labor input because they're in two different places. The, the labor input is recorded as in compensation of employees, and the human capital asset, as mentioned, is, is in net operating surplus. But what is um, quite key here is both the valuation of human capital uses wages and salaries through a lifetime income approach, 
to, to get the value of the human capital stock. And also those wages and salaries also feature as, as a return to labor input within the accounts as COE. So if we didn't, if we just included a return for human capital without doing anything else, then this would cause the double counting. So within modern econ economies, is it, are we looking at a labor input and therefore a return shown as a conversation of employees or a human capital input as a return shown in net operating surplus in the production functions? Or is it we need to start thinking about segregating what we currently record as compensation of employees into a pure labor input and into a pure human capital um, input return. Within the paper, again, we took the simplifying assumption and we treated everything as a human capital um, input and a human capital return. Well, while recognizing that the true um, decomposition is probably somewhere between um, zero and less than or equal to one. So we took the simplifying of treating it as one. So we, we kind of removed the pure labor input and therefore the compensation of employees and treated it as all as returning to human capital. And the actual split might differ between industries as um, some industries might be more labor and less human capital. Well, that was a kind of a journey and work for another day. Uh, and as mentioned, both human capital and labor are evaluated using wages and salaries and, and labor costs. So the final bit, if we've now got a human capital asset owned by households, but for the majority of the time are used by other institutional sectors to produce goods and services. How do we allow that to happen within the framework of the national accounts? And how do we represent it on a transactional basis? Right, the current solve we took within the discussion paper was to look at how this situation with other assets, other physical or intangible assets is resolved. And the parallel is with treating it as an operating lease. So in essence, households lease their human capital to employers in return for a rental payment. And that ends kind of the conceptual points of setting up the, how human capital can be integrated into the economic account system. The Current experimental estimates draw data from the published uh, UK economic accounts and uh, human capital estimates. So we are faced uh, with, for the UK economic accounts, the, the discussion paper used the, the Blue Book 2021 vintage of data. Uh, and the same vintage of data is used within this presentation. And the human capital estimates um, are drawn um, from the the kind of the 2021 vintage as well of publications. Uh, and the ONS human capital estimates are based on a lifetime incomes approach, which is quite standard. And it covers those aged 16 to 65. So it doesn't fully meet the um, definition we're looking for for the data at this point in time, but it does meet, but I, I should mention that the current human capital estimates, the ONS do produce, do meet a number of other stakeholder requirements um, and is, is valid, but further development would need to be taken place for truly getting it into the economic accounts. Because as mentioned, we need to start thinking about this forming as within humans and within the household sector from the start of education and, tra and training. Uh, right, so we, we take these data and present them in the way that meets the human capital satellite account presentation. Uh, 
As mentioned, there are conceptual weaknesses in the current data which future research will look to address for our, our purposes. And this is the first uh, UK presentation of a human capital satellite account, uh, satellite account, and it illustrates the magnitude of the impacts human capital assets could have on the economic accounts. So the first is the, the current experimental results for the reference year 2018 for a number of main macroeconomic aggregates. So gross value added is changed uh, by 406 billion pounds. And, and is uh, an increase of 21% uh, based on the current value for this reference year. Uh, the Changes in net worth, so the, 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 the balance sheet impact of including human capital within our list of assets. It, so the, the actual change between, between uh, two points is 527 billion pounds, and which is 174% of the current estimate. Uh, similarly, gross fixed capital formation has the same 527 billion added to it, which is 138% of the current estimate. So again, we're seeing the kind of human capital asset is a really big asset, and it has real and the flows associated with it can have really big impact impacts. Uh, so, as I mentioned at the start, the net lending, net borrowing position doesn't change because there's, there's no new financing and therefore no new financing requirement. And the final net worth on the, the balance sheet has um, the size of the asset um, of the human capital is, is real big and it changes the current estimate by 204% for the reference year 2018. So this is the impacts for one reference year. We now look at some graphs of the time series. So this is uh, looking at the comparisons of nominal gross value added in levels. The blue line is the, the Blue Book 2021 vintage of data for nominal gross value added without human capital. And the orangey colored line is include this, the same nominal gross value, but including the flows associated with the production of um, uh, human capital assets. So we see broadly a level shift, but a slight, a, some more volatility is included within the estimate. This volatil volatility is partly due to the current estimates um, not allowing us to strip out the revaluation costs uh, and also we could be um, seeing some elements of cohort effects as people join at 16 and people retire at 65 and we have a period where the impact on gva is quite low between 2000 around 2008 and 2010 but this is is explainable, and there's a, a later graph which shows why was what's happening there. So now, if we look at it in growth terms, the nominal gross value added, we see quite a big difference and a, a quite quite a big um, volatility aspect to it. Uh, in particular, we see that the recession in 2008, 2009 caused by the financial crisis, it goes a lot deeper and starts earlier. And similarly, we have a, a the, the human, including human capital creates a recession in the 2016, 2017 period as well. All right. As mentioned, where that was a low impact on GVA, it was caused because what 
is being produced as human capital and therefore consumed as a human capital a gross investment and edu well and what we're taking as education and training intermediate input is very close at that point in time so therefore the value added generated at that point in time is quite low too All right now the comparison of gross fixed capital formation so again, we got this level shift and introduction of volatility. And, and this graph shows the human capital GFCS as a percentage of current uh, UK GFCF. And we see it varies as a percentage terms from 78% to um, around the 240 200, sorry, 278% mark. And then if we have a look at, at human capital as a, as a percentage of current UK net worth, we have a fluctuation again of from a low of 204% to a high of 251%. Uh, of, as a percentage of the current estimate. So again, it kind of gives an idea of the scale of the changes. Uh, human capital as a percentage of UK non-financial assets. So this again is, is a stock estimate and the impact. And non-financial assets are all the buildings, machinery, computer software, and everything else which is, is, a, is, a, is seen as a tangible or intangible asset. So again, we see a, see that human capital assets come in as a, a large, in, compared to the current um, non-financial assets, it would change it to a large degree. And in terms of comparison of UK net worth per capita, we have, again a large level shift as we move uh, as we include human capital assets within in net worth within the uk so for the reference year uh, 2018 the current estimate of uk net worth per capita is around 150 thousand pound and including human capital assets moves that up to uh, so uh, uh, around 450,000 uh, pound per capita. Uh -huh. So by including human capital assets onto the UK balance sheet, everyone in the UK gets a lot richer. So to round up the presentation and to draw some conclusions, Human capital assets are very large assets, as you might expect. Uh, based on current estimates, human capital assets are approximately double the size of the total of all other non-financial assets. Inclusion of human capital assets has a large impact on other main economic aggregates. So because of that large impact, we have to approach things cautiously. But it's not the end of the road. Further improvements need to be made to really get this first attempt into a, a um, more robust state. So further work is needed to capture the buildup of human capital from the start of the education process. Need to identify transactions, revaluations, and other volume changes separately which would refine some of the impacts we've seen in the, the in this presentation. And we need to look to refine the boundary between labor input and human capital assets. And do we have to consider things like the inclusion of the opportunity cost of work experience as an input into the, the human capital production process? The other main area 
that we would need to consider also is, 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 is that for productivity work, um, when it comes to assets, we need to consider what the capital service is. And to do that with the physical assets or the, well, the current tangible and intangible assets, we, we take the stock and apply a age efficiency a profile to it. And this then creates a productive stock. So if we wanted to include human capital in the same way, we'd have to think about what could we use as a age efficiency profile to get the capital services for, for that particular asset. And in the paper, we tentatively suggest that this could be achieved perhaps through the work that, that Mary Mahoney has been looking at on human capital and health and whether the health could function as our age efficiency profile and therefore give us a productive human capital stock and therefore can have the capital services for productivity analysis. Uh, and that's uh, the end of the presentation and I open myself up for any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Robert. That was a really fascinating um, discussion. And th there's so much in there, so much that I feel personally I need to really understand. <laughs> As you know, we have, uh, myself and Carol Carrada and Leah Samak have a, an alternative uh, way of doing this, which is the option one, uh, pretty much, not option two in your, in your slide. Um, and at some stage we need to look and put the two es estimates together and have a discussion. But I have uh, two points on that. Um, uh, I don't want to go into any detail on what we did, but one, one, it seems to me that if you take your option two, then what you really need to do is have a full household production account, not just looking at uh, uh, own account uh, production, you know, of, uh, of output of human capital, but everything else that would be in a household production account it seems to me to be internally consistent that that's what you need to compare with rather than gdp as it is at the moment um and then my second point uh is um where does uh, where do foreign students appear in all this because we, we this is something we found was quite important and um, because this is exports it's not um it's not investment and I, I don't know to what extent um that can be you know seen as a separate kind of transaction within this framework I think it is quite important. So I'll let you very briefly answer those because we have quite a few questions. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know whether you want to take more questions or answer me or... Uh, let's take them individually. So I'll answer you, yeah. you first, Mary. So students, uh, first off, within the, the framework, they are seen as residing in the rest of the world still. And therefore, they would be receiving that flow of um, intermediate... Um, education product, and then and, and then using it as a production in the rest of the world rather than in the UK. So That's in the same sense. way that UK students who might be studying it in the rest of the world, their human capital would need to be captured, but they would receive and we would be receiving an import of an intermediate um, product for them to use in their human capital production function. But I, I, on your first point, it would be interesting to look at the two approaches and do some detailed comparison between the two, I think, and see what the differences are and what the, how the flows differ. Okay, thank you. So um, I'll take the questions in the order they appeared. So the first person to ask questions is Rachel Solobetchik. So um, can we unmute Rachel? Can you hear me? Yes. So. I guess I find obviously education is an important part of the human capital, but it sort of assumes that kids have nothing until they come to school at five. And if you ask people sort of, why aren't you having um, as many kids as you would like in an ideal world, it's often the up to five time is very difficult and expensive. So calling it no human capital seems a little silly. Um, this is partly goes back to Mary's question about the what's household production. Um, within the discussion paper, we're purely focusing on what could be seen as economic basis. 
we weren't looking at, at the informal economy, but you're perfectly right. Now, if we include the informal household economy as well, you would need to start thinking about human capital development from age zero, because the household would be providing some training or education, what could be seen as educational training for that child from word go. It would be a very different world if parents didn't potty train their child and therefore have the child didn't enter the, the working world with that bit of human capital developed in them. But it's not just, you know, the training, just pregnancy, you know, I don't know how much the NHS pays for each birth, but in the U.S. that's a major cost. And it's a market cost. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that could be something we could consider as because, uh, again, we just took the very simplest uh, approach of what can be in that production function. So education training were definite, but yeah, you could look at the actual needing to capture the cost for things like pregnancy and maternity. And you could also look at um, costs associated, other costs, material costs as well, so such as buying books and other things like that. So it's not the end of the, the story, Rachel. It's just kind of the first first um, step forward. So uh, yes, big discussions could be, take place over what's in that human capital production function. Yes, and um, that goes to my questions as well. You're really kind of expanding everything when you. <laughs> Yeah. You start looking, going down that route, you start. And I think Bar Barbara Fermani is my next question. Uh, uh, in a similar kind of vein, I think, Barbara, can we unmute Barbara? Yes, I think I just did. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Okay. Well, I noticed right away that you had no time input, but I guess this is similar to other inputs that were just mentioned, which you're not including, uh, such as books and so forth. But um, um, so it's not just inputs coming from external to the household, there's also uh, internal inputs. And I guess this is a similar theme to what Rachel, Mary, and what I'm saying, what's missing. Yeah, I fully agree that the actual inputs that we're dealing with can be expanded and, and yeah, and, and improved upon. But again, first, first steps. It was a very interesting book by um, uh, Kendrick years and years ago. I don't know if you are you aware of this, Robert, where he he was looking at a um, slightly different way of doing you know investment in education. But he he kind of set out everything, all of this stuff, all in the one framework. Um, and I think it, you know it's worth looking because um, you know from from birth right through all the inputs and outputs. Yeah, <laughs> um, to, yeah, to, yeah. But, but that's basically the cost of. Um, the cost approach versus you mentioned the word lifetime. Uh, yes, but I'm yes. not sure to what extent you're really using a lifetime approach either. So you're you're doing an extremely partial cost, and of course I have sites to the Kendrick book, and it's in the um, 2016 uh, report that you mentioned that the both approaches are covered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So we we are using. The, the the onus estimate of human capital does use the lifetime incomes approach to get their stock estimate and then we we start the the discussion papers started looking at um partly what are the the, the costs so that then the, the value added is the difference between the lifetime incomes approach and the the, the cost side of the, of the equation Um, should we go on to the next there's another, um, set of questions by Isa Tu Sar? Do you want to unmute? Unfortunately, Isa Tu is no longer in the call. Uh, okay, fine. <laughs> right, there's another question by um, uh, Bomwa Tontu Gukat, and I hope I that's probably mispronounced your name. Please, do you want to unmute yourself? <laughs> um, you, you got the pronunciation pretty close. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Actually, um, my research is currently on human capital, but I'm looking at it as this aggregated male and female, trying to look at how the different genders impact on, you know, economic growth, actually. So I'm just asking, like, in the measurement of human capital, 
would you recommend from the inception that it's been looked at from different um, genders to see if there are any like disparities between the contribution of the different genders in particular? Yeah, that's just it. Um, yes, yes, because there is differences. Um, I, the ONS does do a kind of breakdown by gender and also a number of other breakdowns. So yeah, it is it is used and it is useful of that kind of breakdown. Okay, okay. If it already does that, then then that's fine. I'll just um, look into it. Yeah. All, all right. Thank you. That helps a lot. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Well, I should say on that respect, and Bar Barbara from Amy has a really great paper on this. Um, maybe you could correspond with each other where she does quite a lot on the gender aspect of human capital. Okay. Um, okay. The next question is from Christopher Lucas. Do you want to um, unmute yourself? Christopher, can you unmute yourself? I can see you on the call. He may not be able to use his microphone. Okay, so I can, um, Robert, I think you can see the question. It's, um, have you done any estimation excluding education and household investment to age 18 high school? This is basically held by all people anyways. This would be a way to analyze without looking at other household forms of human capital. Uh, no, we haven't. Uh, sorry, I'm just having a look at the quiz. Yeah, if you just look. Sorry, I'm just trying to find it. Uh, no, this is a short answer, isn't it? No, we haven't looked at excluding uh, uh, education and how to eight, uh, 18. So, um, but again, the the idea would be to try and capture, we want to capture all of the human capital assets for, for formation. Okay, any, any, any other questions? If, if, if you want to just ask a question, you can just, um, without typing in, you can uh, raise your hand. I'm just looking through the participants, see if anyone's raised their hand. Or those who've asked already can come back in. <laughs> um, there's also, um, oh no, I have one hand raised here, let's see what it is. Um, uh, this is a Rachel, yeah, cool. <laughs> thing. I guess you're focusing on the educational system, but like, do you exclude stuff like health that Mary talks about that I don't know if I get my um, uh, eyes with fixed with LASIK so I can be a fighter pilot? Um, would that be excluded? Because she's done such great research on that. Well, not on LASIK. Uh, I would say if it's that type of um, intervention, yes, it could be seen as part of the cost to allow you to follow your career that you want to do. Uh, again, it's just identifying it within the current uh, national accounts. It's, it's fine, we will have health expenditure, but that wouldn't necessarily have the granularity necessary to identify the cost item that you're relating to. But Again, uh, ideal world, those types of cost items could be a feature. Any other questions? I mean, there wasn't, uh, oh, here's one, uh, Doug Rendell. Yeah, so this is a good question. Um, could you want to unmute, Jess? I think you can talk, Doug. Seems to be unmuted, but not able to 
I can't hear him. Yeah, I think the microphone probably isn't working. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yes, good. Sorry, <laughs> dialing in via the web, so we, we don't tend to use Zoom, so it's a bit it's a bit hard to, to get it working in our systems. Um, so I'm just I'm just calling dialing in from the, the Bank of England, and, and this is really interesting. So thank you. Um, so I was just wondering if you could say a little bit about how you handle depreciation of human capital within the framework. So, for example, a question that we have kind of thought about here is kind of how work related human capital might have been affected by those on furlough. Um, or a related question could be how certain types of human capital might be affected by a technological change. Uh, so just wondering if you might just say a few words about that. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, right. Um, in the, as I mentioned, that's one of the areas of we need to um, further work on is, the, is the getting the consumption of fixed capital profile right. Um, within the current work, we haven't um, taken it into account as such, that hence why we're using gross measures. Um, but yeah, some care needs to be because things um, can be um it's a case, case of um how long does a piece of it, uh, getting the right time length for the asset for calculating the depreciation is is quite key because some of the human capital that is in existence will last the lifetime whereas some of it is more as you say technologically related and shorter term so it needs to be um considered a, a bit more well, for sure but uh the standard process um is, is within the formula for the lifetime approach has a um con consumption fixed capital element in, in in it so again it's one of those we've taken the first step but the journey is a little bit longer yes i think this this question of depreciation and what we mean by depreciation the difference between depreciation and obsolescence. This, yeah. this affects not just human capital calculations, but you know, the loss of the work on intangibles and, and physical capital. It's, a bit, it's, it's very difficult, I think. Yeah. And we, we probably don't even have the, even if we conceptualize it, is the, are the data there? Data there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> conceptualizing data. it is one thing, and then data, yeah. matching the data to it is another. Yeah, that's a good question. Any other questions? I mean, there was a question about, uh, it, it's gone now, but the impact, I don't know if you saw it on um, the impact of COVID-19 and all this. Um, I don't know, I guess, I don't know how far forward you've come and... and... Um, we only came, um, period I, I went up to was 2018, so we haven't got the COVID years um, mapped out yet. Yeah, but I, I guess they're, they're likely to be quite large effects in various directions. That'd be very um, interesting yeah. to look at. Yeah, it'd be yeah, interesting to look at and trying to sort out um, kind of a, what's the human capital story through COVID. Is it could be quite uh, tricky. Yeah, number of effects uh, could be there to uh, impact it. Okay. Any anybody else want to come? Back in, Rachel or Barbara, do you want to continue this discussion? <laughs> Again, have a look and see if there's anyone with their hands up. Yeah, Barbara, come on, come back in, yes, please. I, I think most of what else I would say, I'm going to email um, comments as, as Mary knows, I've thought about adjusting human capital. I'll use it in the context of ours, but the paper she saw has been is in process of being very hugely revised. Uh, but I've thought about this um, efficiency adjustment uh, re with regarding uh, labor. Uh, I'll be really welcome to have your comments, Barbara. Um, I don't, is there any more? Um, 
don't see any more questions or any more hands up. So if, 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 if there are no more questions, then I'd just like to uh, uh, thank Robert for, I mean, a, a really fascinating piece of work. I and mean, I've had a look at the, the discussion paper and it's nice to get the slides and I still have to get my head around parts of this. <laughs> I think we'll be having more discussion about this as we go forward. Uh, it's great. So I'd like to um, finish by announcing that the, this will be the final, um, the next seminar, which will be the final one in the uh, this series this year. And it's being presented by uh, Miriam Storyer from the University of Graz on the 23rd of March at 12.30, usual time. Uh, and the, the title is The Capitalization Rate of Energy Efficiency Improvements in the Housing Market, um, a micro level analysis for England and Wales. So that sounds a very interesting um, topic, topical. Um, so I hope uh, we'll see uh, many of you at this. Um, and so, Thanks again, Robert, for, for, for a very interesting talk and to the participants. Thank you. Thank you.